Dr. Alan Kamora is a guy I met back in Uh There's I met Dr. Kamora back in 2005 when I was a volunteer for the uh, Foundation Fighting Blindness, uh, kind of helping get the Denver chapter going again here, and I put on a symposium at the uh, University of Denver that year when I was a volunteer. And um, that's where I met Dr. Kamura. I met uh, our chief uh, scientific officer, Steve Rose, came in for that day, and they put on a whole day presentation at the University of Denver. Was anybody, is anybody here, were, were they there that day in 2005 when we held that symposium? Can you clap your hands? Oh, great, great. So you survived, okay, good. And so I've been with the foundation since 2006, and I wanna thank, first I wanna thank Dr. Mandava, Dr. Oliver, uh, Jackie Trujillo, Mary Preston, Bethany Jackson, and all the team here at the Rocky Mountain Lions Eye Institute for providing this facility for us today. So let's give them a big hand for doing that. Also, uh, we have with us today our one of our board of directors for the Foundation Finding Blindness, Sherry Cronenberg, and her husband, Carl. Sherry, where are you? In the back. In the back. Thanks, Sherry, for being here. And you've seen a lot of our chapter leaders are here. Uh, you, Carol Martz was at the front desk, uh, Maria Stachelek, uh, Linda Worth is in the crowd. My, you made a, a run into her, literally. Uh, so. <laughs> no injuries today. No injuries. Claudia Fabian, kind of a, almost a chapter leader, has been around it for so long with me. Um, who am I forgetting? Who else is here today? Michelle Weeks, that's right. Michelle Weeks and her mom, Marge West, one of our great volunteers and supporters for over the years. Thanks, Michelle. Anybody else? All right. All right, Doc, when you can close. Yep, no, I, I think we're ready. Ready to go. Okay. All right, now I'd like to introduce, um, you know, our medical chair for the Denver chapter of the Foundation Fighting Blindness, a great friend, my eye doctor, Dr. Alan Kamor from Colorado Retina Associates. Thank you very much, Richard, for that kind introduction. It's, it's good to be back here with everybody back in our, uh, the community that we've uh, progressively built over the years. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I'm speechless after what was just presented. Uh, the success on so many levels, the, just the thought of Dr. Humayun, and then the persistence, the engineering, the surgical expertise. So the surgeons in the audience, uh, Dr. Jackson and Arnold, like we're, we're just in awe of what uh, Dr. Oliver and Mandava accomplished because we know what it takes. There's a big pucker factor and so many things had to go basically perfectly to get this done. So hats off to that team. And then to uh, hear uh, and see Jamie bear witness to this, it's, it's, I'm speechless. But I'm going to have to now start speaking. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> so uh, you may notice uh, that I finally, after lecturing all this time, I finally realized, oh, um, like when Tin Shaman lectures, it's yellow font on a black background. So instead of being in my sighted world and making pretty color slides, I'm trying to adapt and try to reach out to where you are. So hopefully this helps. So uh, I'm trying to use that now. So once upon a time, the world was flat, right? But now it's truly a global effort, right? We know the, 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 the world is around. So I'm trying to give you a view from uh, low Earth orbit here. The point is that every great achievement was once considered impossible, right? Take that Argus II, for example. That was impossible, but you just saw proof. So here, so I divided the strategies for visual loss into four categories. So uh, Dr. Oliver talked about this, but let me just hit it briefly. Bionic devices, then we'll do gene therapy, optogenetics, stem cells, and I threw in a little teaser about CRISPR at the end, so bionic devices. So I have a picture here of Steve Austin, the USA astronaut, the $6 million man. Those of us of a certain age with uh, graying and thinning hair know that was a popular show in the 70s. And this is some quotes. This is the, the program that said, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. So I knew about his legs and eyes, but I didn't know. But back then, they even hypothesized a bionic eye. Okay, so here we are, 40 years <laughs> later. So what did they do? Engineering? Well, here's a cochlear implant, right? A sense organ. They have a bionic device. 
you just saw this brilliant lecture on Argus 2. So I learned a little bit of trivia. Apparently, um, Cynthia, correct me if I'm, uh, Scott, if I'm wrong, that apparently you need 1,000 electrodes maybe to get facial recognition. So we're describing, right, at 60 electrodes the performance that you have. But certainly they're working on the electronics to get a higher pixel density, higher performance. And then you've all heard about this miniature implantable telescope where you're just projecting the image through this telescope where your lens used to be onto a broader area, displacing the image beyond the dysfunctional scar. So just that's a little brief snapshot of bionics. But we're really here to talk more about the next level. So we're going to talk about gene therapy. Rich, you want me to talk about like what's actually going on at the patient level, the translational science. So you got two pictures here. One of it's like a blow up of a 54 tranny here, they're overdrive. So it's a parts manual. But now we understand the parts manual of human disease as the DNA molecule. Okay? So all the advances in DNA have put us in a totally different space. So just in a nutshell, gene therapy, you know, you got to get the reparative gene segment inside that cell. Um, that outer cell membrane is resistant to that. So you have to package it in something that's already through evolution, can get through that cell membrane. That's a virus, an adenovirus. It's basically a cold virus, something that's not pathological. So basically that's the suitcase, okay? And the suitcase has a certain size. So for instance, um, the, L the RPE65 gene is small enough to fit into this adenovirus too. But the Stargardt gene is too big. So size matters here. So once you're through the outer cell membrane, you gotta get it into the, uh, the, the center of that um, cell and to change its program, you gotta get inside the nucleus. So that's it in a nutshell, you know that. But how do you get it to the right tissue? For the eye, <clears throat> it's unique, right? So if, if you have a, a uh, like the first disease was an immunodeficiency disease, so they had to give it massive doses by vein. The eye is unique, okay? It's, think of it as a little own compartment. So it's very useful for study. So the way to get that in there is, yes, surgery, go through the pars plana just the same way you got that implant in there. Then with the needle, you have to go back to the retina, create a little blister, artificially detach the retina, so now you can access the subretinal space, and then you inject those viral particles with the reparative gene segment. So this is a, a, a graph from uh, Stephen Dager. <coughs> And it shows all the genes that have identified for retinal dystrophies. And it shows over the last 10, 15 years, just a steady upward rise. Uh, so we're about 260 genes. It's, it's just stunning. Every year, the slide's going to be updated. So it shows the highest number of the ones that's mapped. They have a crude idea where it is. But nowadays, with the, with the precision of molecular biology, we can actually identify that gene. A smaller percentage of that are ones that are actually in animal trials. And then an even smaller number are in humans. But as time goes by, all those, that massive uh, is going to progressively increase. We'll have more trials for humans. So this is another thing. So uh, the data is silo. So in business, we know that's a problem, right? Different divisions of an organization have the same data, but they're not talking to each other. Same problem in medicine and the genetic testing. So what we need to do is... There's three separate kind of spaces. There's the patient pool, there's the doctor pool, and the researcher pool. The goal is that, you know, in that Venn diagram where they overlapped, you've got the right patient with the right doctor that knows something about inherited diseases. And now, that same smaller group is accessible to the right researcher. So that's the goal. It's like trying to get out of our silos, have all this stuff working together. So that's what we're working towards. And you can operationalize it through this My Retina Tracker. So it's, it's so, so something going on in healthcare is called a, a Qualified Clinical Data Registry. Or it's just basically, so you're, it's a formal way of just submitting your data in a anonymized way, so it's safe, right, it's HIPAA compliant, so that it's accessible by researchers. So instead of having to go like, hey, where am I gonna find a patient like this? They go, whoa. I see 50 patients that are located in these different regions. All of a sudden now you have more power, more mass. Okay, so that researcher now knows he can access more patients. Guess what? He or she's gonna be working in that area. Likewise, attracting funding. So it's, it's this positive cycle when we start using this information, aggregating it properly. So that's where we're going forward. Okay, so now that you know my gene mutation, when is my gene therapy? So rapid progress, so just here's five. Uh, and there are different stages. So LCA, the RPE65 gene, right? That's our, I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. Choroid arena, we know the gene. 
There was a trial for that in England. Star guts, we know that gene, ABCA4. They're going to be starting that. Retinoschisis, we know the gene for that. Ushers, ushers to it, we know the gene. So this is the next step that we had to get to. Well, what's the part that's broken? Then we can try to fix it. So here's a slide I took from, uh, I bought from uh, Dr. Shane. It's kind of an update of all these trials going on and their stages. So um, now you're seeing these companies associated. So it's moving out of the lab. Now it's getting commercialized. That's the next step. Big money's behind it, investors, because they know it's got to go to the next phase where you can scale it up. So Spark Therapeutics is working on the um, RPE65 gene mutation. Oxford Biomedica, working on a number of gene therapies. Stargardt's, Ushers, actually starting macular degeneration. Um, Nightstar is working on choroideremia. Another big company is AGTC. They have a whole portfolio of different genes. They're working on retinoschisis. And importantly, X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. I'll talk about that in a second. And then there's uh, the, the dominant diseases, where the product is not, or the problem is not so much a lack of the correct protein, but the protein that's made is actually, uh, oftentimes there's a stop code on it. It's a smaller size protein. It's dysfunctional, and it can actually kind of poison the retina. So you might want to stop that, or if it's, or you might want to leap ahead, correct that stop code on, and keep the the uh, translation of that into the proper size protein. So here's a, uh, I've copied the actual New England Journal of Medicine article from May 14, 2015, entitled Long-Term Effect of Gene Therapy on Labors in General Amaurosis. Okay, so, you know, earlier we were talking, okay, we're just starting the trial. Well, now the next phase is, well, what are the results over time? So again, this RPE65 gene therapy for labors is a phase one or two trial, 12 patients. And it's following their, the function over three years, which is pretty impressive, three or follow. So there were improvements in the sensitivity of the retina. So you can see uh, more, you know, dimmer objects more, more readily. But what they're noticing is that it, the effect, the benefit, peaked at 6 to 12 months, then gradually declined. So that's a bit of a disappointment because we were hoping for something more durable. But again, this is just a phase one, two trial. They're going to figure this out, hopefully, whether this is the, the way to go or is this specific to the RPE65 gene. That there's a number of questions that they're going to have to work on. So here's the graph, the actual data. There's 12 patients. Four received the low dose. 12 received the high dose. Some didn't have any, any improvement, and the ones that did showed this rapid improvement, but then at 6, 12 months, but then it tapered off. So that gives us a little cause for concern. How do you get a more durable effect? Um, so other things. So the, when you looked at the Briard dog, it was like seemed to be sustainable. So we're now learning there are species differences in the gene therapy that we hadn't, that we hadn't envisioned. Uh, so it, so if the goal is for a durable and robust effect. And we're a little short of that goal, at least with the adenovirus and the RPE65 gene. Now here's a copy of a paper from The Lancet, the British Journal. Retinal gene therapy in patients with choroideremia. So these are initial, I think, six month um, results. This is from March 2014. So again, a different disease, choroideremia. So it's a multi-center trial, as, as are all of these, right? Because there aren't that many patients. And this is, um, again, an adenovirus. Uh, so they found that, the interestingly, in two of these six that had, that had actually not so good vision, they had the most gain, 21 letters and 11 letters. That, that, that's hugely impressive. So about two to four lines of vision. The four of those six that had pretty good, best corrected vision um, only improved maybe one to three letters. So the point is, like, each of these diseases is probably going to behave a little differently when you do the gene therapy. So it's hard to generalize off of just one. Okay, it's tempting, but now as we're accumulating more evidence, we're seeing that, you know, um, if you've seen one, you've seen one. So here's the chart. This is from the Croydoremia Research Foundation. It shows a typical timeline, right? So maybe 10, 15 years from you have the gene from massive amounts of effort and investment that actually gets something that's starting to be used in humans. So the time course is important, right? Everyone wants the cure today, but I think all of us know it's not there immediately, but actually things are happening. That, that's the impressive thing. It's about 10, 15 years. 
Here's uh, Jean Bennett, right, coming off her success with the RPE65. Now she's working on choroideremia. So excellent recessive um, disease. Choroideremia affects men, about 1 in 50,000. Again, it's an AAV, the adenovirus vector. We know the gene, and it's being done at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in Miami, University of Oxford, University of Alberta, Children's Eye Hospital, and UPenn. So again, it's a global phenomenon. The goal would be to slow down or at least halt the progression of this, um, of this disease. Um, I came across that apparently in June 24th, 25th in Philadelphia, they're having a conference on choroideremia. Another disease, gene therapy, excellent retinoschisis. Maybe 140,000 estimated males worldwide are affected. We know the gene. So they designed a uh, gene therapy. It's an intravitreal injection. So it's inside the eye, much easier. You don't have to detach the retinas and inject it under the retina. So in terms of surgery, much easier. Um, AGTC, which is Applied Genetics Technologies Corporation. So, for, so it's interesting, uh, when, I, when I go to these meetings, a lot of people are asking me, Kind of like, hey, what's the hot topic is a possible investment? I hadn't thought of that. I'm just, we're thinking about the science. But for those that are interested in investments, interesting that some of these companies have the early lead. They may end up, uh, who knows, being the, the next big company. So AGTC has a phase one, two safety study for excellent retinoschisis, and they're, they're, they're going after 27 patients in collaboration with the Oregon, Massachusetts Ioneer, the Retina Foundation of the Southwest, and Kellogg at the University of Michigan. Interestingly, also the National Eye Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, is planning a phase one, two study for excellent retinoschisis for 100 patients. So I sh I'm showing you this image, the ocular coherence tomography above shows the normal retina. The lower image shows the splitting, the schesis, that's typical and affects central vision in the males that have excellent retinoschisis. So a little brief segue into the that the folding, of, so when the, when the proteins are assembled one at a time, it's a string. But their function is derived from the eventual shape that's taken. So if you had the wrong letters put in, the word or, or that molecule is misspelled. So I have a picture now of the, it's the silent drill team of the Marines, the rifle brigade. So their precision is critically dependent on the proper spacing. Right? Obviously, they practice their function. And can you imagine if the rifles that they're, sp that they're spinning and twirling were like wrong size or different mass? So all that precision of that team would be thrown off if they didn't have the right, right piece of structure. Likewise, in your cell, if you don't have the right size, right shape proteins, they may not function properly. So here shows the translation. Um, and, and oftentimes, the disease-causing mutation Instead of it saying, put on this particular amino acid for the protein, it's the instruction set that says, stop. So your protein elongation just stops. You get the smaller protein. So if we could figure out how to, how to correct that, then the protein can be made successfully. And they think they found a molecule that might help that. So it's correcting the instructions to keep producing the right length. So that, that's pretty interesting. Okay, so now we're on a topic called optogenetics. When I first heard this, I'm like, what, what does that mean? Well, it combines two things, okay? So uh, light, optics, and then genetics, gene therapy. And you're like, well, what would you do that for? Well, the whole basis of optogenetics is the following. It's to control cellular functions, or actually neural pathways, actually, in living animals with light, using light-sensitive proteins to change the signaling, change the behavior. So these are some applications. This is outside of eye. So depending on what part of the brain you use, you might be able to change behavior in terms of fear conditioning. So there's this great video of this mouse running around, and when they shine the blue light, it changes the neural pathway, and it stops running around in a panic. You're going like, wow. So look at that. You can control living creatures with light. I mean, that's pretty crazy when you think about it. But more, but, but other things, um, if you work on the olfactory system, smell. Smell has a lot to do with aggression in animals, right? They, that's, they use that for signaling. So you could change that behavior. Mating behavior can also change based on influencing the, 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 the smell pathway. And also for therapy, they found that cocaine addiction. Think if you could modify that by using light therapy. Wow. 
And then they're using you know, the, 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 the hearing pathway, they're trying to restore hearing in deaf mice. So they're going, oh, now they're working on sense organs, and that's why we're interested. So there's an optogenetics trial by RetroSense Therapeutics in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and the Retina Foundation of South the West. What are they trying to do? They're trying to genetically modify ganglion cells, right? As Dr. Oliver said, those are the cells that pass the message from the photoreceptors back to the occipital cortex to see. So they're kind of like messenger cells, but now we're trying to convert them to light-sensing cells. How do you do that? You inject DNA from light-sensitive, these are algae, that have this little sensing organ for light, or sensing protein. If you integrate that into the ganglion cells, so instead of just being the messenger, they now become the light-sensing tissue. Pretty wild, whoever thought of that. So the goal is to recreate a new sense organ from the existing cells. Again, repurposing ganglion cells to act like photoreceptors, because then if you have like retinitis pigmentosa, your photoreceptors aren't working. The bipolars, the next cell, and then the ganglion cells, in theory, are still functioning. You can use those ganglion cells in the case of the Argus II for right, putting that epi-retinal electrode array on there. Or in this case, you can actually genetically modify the proteins that are, that are studded on the surface of these ganglion cells to sense light. Pretty cool stuff. So, this, so what's the reality? It's an early trial. It's a proof of principle to go from you know, studying mice and monkeys to go to humans. They're looking at 15 patients. Well, the challenge is how will the brain interpret these new signals? So we talked about that, Jamie talked about this. So, so you have a certain level of vision and it's not used, and all of a sudden you're getting new input, your brain has to figure out what's going on again. Likewise, that's gonna be a challenge to have to figure out, because you're kind of putting these proteins in there and you don't know where they're gonna land and which ganglion cells are gonna become activated. The value of the Argus II is you can reprogram it. So it doesn't matter where they land, you can kind of reorder them so you put the image back together. How will that happen with this? That, that those are questions for generations beyond this. This is, again, just a kind of proof of principle. And this particular channel rhodopsin only responds to intense blue light. Um, so in the real world, of course, I'm showing that there, here's the, 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 the chart of, we actually have four pigments that we rely on. Uh, so the rods, which are you know, basically black and white vision. But then we have three other proteins um, that give us, that spread across the rest of the, the, the visual spectrum that we interpret. So the blue, green, and red cones. So eventually they'll hopefully figure out how to put in uh, rhodopsins that are similar to the humans to approximate human color vision. But for now, right, for many of us, we'd just be happy, boy, if we could see shadow shapes, okay? But this is where we'll ultimately hand, head. And then how they're programmed. So, the, so we don't talk about this a lot. So cones have a very direct signal. It goes from one cell all the way to the, from one cone cell to a ganglion cell. So that's to have very high precision. Whereas rods, many of them feed in to activate one single ganglion cell. So that's good for getting very sensitive systems. You want a lot of um, photoreceptors out there activated to tell you if there's any light at all. So that's the rod system. It's good for low light but it's not good for discriminating details. Cones are what you need for details. And here's a, uh, a uh, tissue slide stained. It, it's deliberately inverted for the typical orientation where the photoreceptors or retinal pigment thelium are at the bottom. And the ganglion cell at the top layer, and it's showing that it's staining. So it's actually taking up, it's, it's becoming these light sensitive cells. So now the last section, stem cells. So back in the middle ages, <coughs> There is this search for the philosopher's stone. These alchemists um, were trying to turn base metals, lead, into gold. So things of lesser value into things of much greater value. Also, these alchemists were looking for the elixir of life, rejuvenation, and immortality. Centuries later, we're still working on the same thing, right? <laughs> Turning things of lesser value, like you know, adult skin cells, into valuable pluripotent stem cells. They've done that. And these pluripotent stem cells can become virtually any cell and are capable of self-replication. So that's the immunity, that's the immortality thing. So we're doing alchemy now in the 21st century. So remember that parts of the transmission slide? Well, here's another cartoon. It's the stem cell depot. And, the, 
and the guy's walking up the front desk talking to the parts guy, he says, you got a femur for a 57 Caucasian? <laughs> uh, the, right, you gotta have the thought first and then you start working for it, that might happen. And again, it's gonna be operationalized through our understanding of DNA and proteins. So the main stem cell sources, you're all familiar with that, right? There's two types that we're, that we're talking about now, embryonic stem cells and the ones that are induced um, from adult cells. So the human embryonic, they're from in vitro fertilized eggs. So they're coming from these IVF clinics. So you grow them to a certain stage, and then there's this little ball of cells that you harvest, put them in a Petri dish, put them in the light, right factors, and they go on down their various pathways. It might be red cells, you know, blood cells, neural cells, muscle cells, obviously for the eyes, a visual system, we're interested in the neural cells. The other way is to take, so, so here, here's, a, here's a little side story. So, you know, there's moral, political, ethical issues around human embryos and their, their, their harvesting. So the month before 9-11, it's kind of lost in history, Bush said, okay, we're only working on this many lines of stem cells and the rest, forget it, that's all you get. So faced with that, other states says, wait a second, we want to keep studying this. So California said, forget it, we're going to self-fund this as a state. We're going to keep working on this. And of course, other countries did too. So it turns out that research or, or that ban on human embryonic stem cells led to research leading to these things, where you can get pluripotent stem cells from useless kind of adult skin cells by changing only four kind of genes which is staggering, it was like simpler than we thought. And for that, Shin Yamanaka and John Gurdon got the Nobel Prize in medicine in 2012. So this is like that level of science that we're talking about. That's being put to use for us right here. So what do you do with these new cell lines? The, the obvious one is, well, okay, something's broken, fix it, replace those cells. But there's many more other things you could do with that. So, you can induce these pluripotent cells, but if they're still the ones using your same old DNA with a defect, that's no good. So maybe do gene therapy on these new stem cells, then put them back in, correct that error. And they've already done that in mice, correcting some bloodborne errors. But the cooler thing is actually studying this, this, this big puzzle of, well, how does a human normally develop? You can't exactly do studies on that. But now, if you have these pluripotent stem cells, you can actually study normal human development in every step along the way. Likewise, you can then study drug effects in a Petri dish. It's amazingly expensive and time-consuming to do studies in humans. Imagine if you could do some preliminary testing on these cells in a Petri dish. That would revolutionize things. The cost of, you know, like so you know, we're hearing about the engineering costs. Well, the cost of these drugs, you know, 800,000, you know, just the, the startup costs. Um, if we could drop them, that time we'll have many more things to work on. So that, that, that's the breakthrough, I think. So stem cells and idovolume. So we don't know, it, it's like how do you get from like, right, one cell to every cell that we have that are so different? Is it, does it just run on an automatic program? And how is this done? Or are there signals spit out by other cells, their neighboring cells saying, okay, at this stage, now you do this, you change into this shape, you develop into this thing, you do this movement. So that this whole development thing is just being understood. So I have an, this, this stunning image on the right by Sasaki in Japan. We're using stem cells, they self-organize into a little eye cup. You're know, like, what? So <clears throat> kind of mother nature is like pretty amazing, but it can only grow so far because then you need to recruit a blood supply to feed it nutrients to grow more cells. But it's just amazing that you can get that far just on self-organization. That's already programmed in our DNA, right? The, the product of many, many years of evolution. Okay, so we have these stem cells, what are you gonna do with them? We're obviously interested in blindness, but all the stuff in the brain is important too, all that research. So here's a slide, so this is very important, that the eye is not a separate organ, it's really a forward projection of our central nervous system. It is brain tissue, okay? So we, you know, so we heard again about that um, with Jamie, so, or, 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 or Mrs. Cruz, that um, while there's an implant you can put on the retina, what about putting it right in your brain, right? Because that's the part that's doing the seeing, the occipital cortex. Another way to go. 
Five okay, so this, so here's here's brain development. This shows the the highly ordered structure of layers. Now I'm going to show you the eye. Same thing, layers, right? RPE, photoreceptors, bipolars, ganglion cells. So that's critical to understand. And then you're familiar with these slides in retinitis pigmentosa. The tissue collapses because the photoreceptors are dying. So now here's here's different ways to approach this. These are human embryonic stem cells. RPE transplants ejected under the retinas. This is Steve Schwartz, published his results in The Lancet, February 2015. Um, we don't have time to go through all the results. It's a basic trial. You have to be on solid organ immunotransplantation. So it's just a safety study. I'll show you these pictures here of a human eye. So you can see that as the pigment's increasing that those cells have engrafted successfully. So 72% of the transplant recipients of these embryonic cells of the RP had measurable increases in the pigmentation and increased over time and it appears to be safe. So that's very interesting. The RPE cells appear to be safe. Now here's the re-neuron trial. So this is a UK company and they're approaching again the brain, stroke. 150,000 patients suffer from stroke. So they're going after that, but they were like, wait a second, we should work on the eye too. And they, in fact, are working with the Mass Eye and Ear, University of College of London, Moorfields, and, of course, Foundation Fight and Blindness. They're taking human retinal progenitor cells, this whole family of cells that populate the retina, and they're using that to engraft. It's a phase one, two safety study, 15 patients with advanced RP, a single sub-retinal injection, 12-month follow-up. So this has just started. I think they're their first patient at Mass Eye and Ear this year. Yeah, so it's a big deal, first in the U.S. Here's another approach, Henry Klassen, um, University of Colorado, from, again, that California, California. Institute. I'm sorry? California. California. Yeah, California, yeah. Uh, so they're going after RP. Uh, so, right, we all know the rods are lost. Later on, the cones are lost, and that's when it really becomes a problem, right? You lose your, your, your acuity. So there's this bystander effect. It, what if we could keep those cones alive longer, even though the rods are dying? That would be a huge benefit, right? That's, that's his theory, okay? So <laughs> this is, these are slides of, in the RCS, the Royal College of Surgeon RP rat. So there's a little ball of these retinal progenitor cells sitting in the vitreous. And they're spitting out these little life-sustaining chemicals that are going to hopefully keep those cones alive. So you're not rebuilding the retina, but you're keeping the cells, those vitally important cone cells, alive longer, and that's the hope. So eight patients, 12-month trial, again, advanced RP using retinal progenitor cells injected in the middle of the eye, so much easier to do. The last one, so I have a picture of green sod, then a bald spot. That's, that's analogous to geographic atrophy in the advanced form of dry macular degeneration. So here, how to repair that? You lay new sod. So this is Dr. Dennis Clegg. So he has this retinal patch. So it's a two-part thing. There's this perylene, kind of the basement structure that supports these re-engineered RPE cells. So here's the structure. So there's these little columns that provide strength, and then a very ultra-thin layer that's on which the, these RPE cells sit. It's thin enough that they can exchange oxygen and sugar and all the nutrients. On top of that, he puts the RPE cells, and they're, now that they have this relationship, they behave differently. They're less likely to form a tumor. They're not going to go wandering around looking for where to plant their roots. They already know what to do. Once they've set up shop, they can release these neurotrophic factors. So it's, they're functioning just like real cells. So I think he may have something here. This is the next step. So here's some still photos of the surgery, similar to what Dr. Uh, Oliver showed. Um, you make you vitrectomy, you get to the back of the retina, you, you cut that wet Kleenex, the retina, and then you slide in this little patch, which you can actually fold up. This is, again, we stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. So lens implants used to be this big, huge Sputnik type thing, but now it's foldable. So it's smaller, a small incision, you inject it in the eye, and then it flips open like a satellite, smaller incision. Likewise, the retina, smaller incision, right, less damage. So here he is putting in his patch. Last section, I know we're running out of time. But this is the, the coolest thing, gene editing. 
Okay, I, I see <laughs> all, the, all the people that know all the high science. So that's, yeah, Kelsey Zeger back there. She's our certified genetics counselor. I'm, she, she, I'm sure she's excited about this too. So think if you could change the DNA permanently, not just put in a gene therapy that kind of corrects that one protein. This is, this is so exciting. This was kind of big news at the ARVO meeting last year. So CRISPR, what's it stand for? Clustered regularly and dispersed short palindromic repeats. It's just, it, it describes this very specific pattern that gives it very specific properties. And it's married to this other molecule that gives it specificity of where, to, where, where along the whole DNA segment, where you want to make the, where you want to target. So it's actually think of it like molecular scissors. It's a little tiny machine. They can read your DNA, find the exact gene that you're interested in, snip it out. And then, if you have the right gene, you can put the, the correct copy back in there and forever change that cell. Forever. It's engineered. At least that's the theory. So they're, you know, they're doing it in like some animals and cells already. This is the biggie. So Dr. Uh, C Stephen Chang at uh, Columbia University is working on fibroblasts, inducing them, using CRISPR to cut that out, and, and he's trying to change the cellular function of the RP. RPGR gene, right, which is for X-link RP. So in these cells, he's been, he's been able, it's like a 13% correction rate, that's pretty good, to correct the RPGR mutation. Wow. That's, so a lot of people are jumping on this technology because it's, it's actually godlike potential. It's so much that apparently the leading researchers in the world gathered in Washington, D.C. in December of 2015, they said, we got to reach consensus here because this technology can get can run away from us. And they said we got to put the brakes on this. It's way too scary. It, the progress it's going to go forward though, right? It's impossible to stop. But they want to do it in a very rational and controlled way so you don't do damage to this whole technology. So here we are review. So we went through bionic devices, right? The, the Argus two. Um, they'll eventually get more pixel dens density. The telescope. Gene therapy, right? More and more of these are reaching the human level. More and more people, you know, it's patients. If you have your gene mutation, you're in a different class now, right? You can now access the trials. Optogenetics, that's more bench research, right? Trying to convert non-seeing, non-light sensing ganglion cells into light sensing cells. Stem cells, that's very sexy, but a lot of work's gonna need to be done with that. Different ways of putting them in. Which cell's important? Now we're understanding the host into which you're putting those cells is actually just as important, just as important as the cells you've designed. And then the CRISPR-Cas9 for gene editing. So there's an extensive portfolio of research that's going on here. So my last sl two slides, the research tree is blossoming. So on the left is this barren tree, which it wasn't that long ago I was standing up here saying, I hope we get something. But now the tree, it's springtime. There's a lot of buds. Things are happening. This is for real. And I leave you with the final thought. It's a slide from our, one of our vision walks, the balloons, bunch of people. So you know, we're talking all this science, right? But it's, but it's the day-to-day -day stuff. It's really about the support you have and the perseverance that you as an individual have to carry. So you keep your friends and family close. To the, and then this, the community that we're building, that's, that's how we're going to get through this and get to the next level, OK? Thank you very much. Mike, I got a mic. Hi, my son has told me he's had his gene testing done and he has a gene issue is, is one that's not been studied yet. It sounds like some of these things you talked about, it might not matter which specific gene is causing the problem. Yes, or, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, so there's different approaches. So one is where it's highly specific, target of that gene, um, and then you repair it or correct it. But then there's some of these other things where it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's, it's disease agnostic. If that cell isn't working, you might be able to replace it, right? 
with a stem cell or a device. So you're correct. There's multiple ways that uh, we can we can attack the problem of vision loss. Oh. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Is there any possibility that either uh, gene therapy or stem cell therapy uh, uh, clinical trials will be available in Colorado in the near future? Um, it's a global effort with multiple centers. It hasn't reached a level where it's kind of like a Starbucks, right, where it's on every <laughs> uh, No, so it, that's a real problem. Like, so if you have this disease, you know what you have, you've done your homework, you've done the due diligence. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. I turned it off. Sorry. Um, yeah, the problem is, well, how do I get this done? So unfortunately, you probably have to travel. Yeah. Um, so perhaps, I don't know what the university has planned or Foundation for Fine Blindness, but they're picking, you know, they're, they're going with a, a number of centers right now that have historically they've worked with. As they get more experience, uh, unquestionably, there's going to be the demand to go Starbucks with it, right? Put, get, make it more available because you can't travel there that often. So I don't know what the long-term strategies are for that, Richard, but yeah, certainly that's an unmet need that, that, you, that you're correct. Yes, and um, I might, uh, can you turn this on? Uh, let's see. I don't know how to turn it on. Let me try that. Yes, the Foundation Fighting Blindness has several centers. Uh, closest here, of course, is Retina Foundation of the South. Retina Foundation of the Southwest in Dallas, uh, University of Utah at the Moran Eye Center in Salt Lake City. Uh, those are the two closest here. And there's, but there's different trials. They're not all the same in everywhere. So uh, it has to do a lot with the uh, biopharmaceuticals who we're partnering with and where they have developed collaborations and relationships. So uh, there is a website, www.clinicaltrials.gov where you can go and check out, put in your, you know, your disease, your gene mutation, and it will give you a list of where something is going on around the world. That's a good thing to go. There is a, somebody mentioned genetic testing. Uh, the, the Foundation Fighting Blindness has a uh, company called Informed DNA that uh, we can put you in touch with to help develop, you know, get the genetic testing, I mean, getting your uh, genetic counseling and then also getting your genetic testing done in different laboratories around the country and following up on that. So if you're interested in that, see the, uh, leave your information at the foundation table outside or at the registration desk and say you'd like information and I will send it to you. Uh, also we have, uh, was it Kelsey, is it Swigert? Seagart. Uh, Kelsey is here. Uh, she is a genetic counselor for Children's Hospital. And I asked her, uh, you, she, you heard her say herself back there, ask her to stand by the Foundation Fighting Blindness booth, the registration area, after, at our break. If you'd like to get some information on that, she'd be happy to help you with that. And Dr. Oliver, uh, is uh, University of Colorado got any plans for gene therapy? He, or he had, he had to leave. Does Mary or anybody else know? Well. I'm sure they'll be happy to tell you, though, so ask around and uh, you'll find out. Okay, any other questions for Dr. Kimura? Right over here. Yeah, that was a great presentation, and I was wondering, there were some things I saw in it, actually several things that I wanted to do some more in-depth study on. Is there somewhere we can access the slides or get a printout or something? Yeah, no, I'll, so I'll, fast. I'll, I'll upload them or I'll give them to Richard. Yeah. yeah. He'll send me a PDF, yeah. and then I'll uh, yeah leave your information at the front desk and uh, that you want the PDF of the presentation, and we'll get it to you. Okay, more questions? Yes. Hold on, I'll get you Ted. Here you go. At the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned, and I couldn't tell, is it a database you can put your name on? Yeah, I think the My Retina Tracker. Can you talk more about that, Richard? My yes, the, uh, in, your bro in the uh, program that we gave you, there's information on My Retina Tracker, but that's the exact website as well, myretinatracker.org. And what that is, is you'll go in there and put all of your information, answer all the questions. It'll be in this database. It's a secure database. And that way we, we provide this information, you know, where it's, uh, you know, where they can't tell the patient's name or anything, but they can just tell what disease they're looking for. And they will say screen it. We've got about three or 4,000 people right now. We'd like to have uh, three or 400,000 people. 
well, I don't know if we have that many patients in this United States, but we'd like to have as many as possible because that way the biopharmaceuticals and the researchers that are going to be looking for patients for their different trials and research that are going on, it's very important that you go online and put that information in. And that, that information is in your brochure. Next uh, Dr. Kimura, I'm elderly but uh, still sensuous. And, uh, <laughs> oh, and uh, oh, oh. I want to know what are my chances for being chosen for a study? Um, yeah, so it, it, it's, it's not so much as an, um, an individual thing. So in these scientific studies, they have very rigid inclusion criteria. What disease, what stage you're at than exclusion criteria. So if you meet that, then that's your, your, you've got past that red velvet rope, and then, you know, the, then the study you know, um, coordinators and the researchers now have a pool of patients they can look at, and then it's a matter of you know, discussing with you in deep detail to make sure that you understand what the study's trying to accomplish, make sure your goals are there. Are, are, are reasonable for the, for the study and you understand. So the informed consent process is, is a very rigorous one as well. So I, I think that there is a path to connect all these different steps. Did, did I answer your question? Uh, to, to a point, uh, but by the way, I'm uh, still looking for a blind date. You know? <laughs> I think you have a job have, as a, as on, a, on TV or radio, quite frankly. That's our, that's our tenth vendor that we'll have outside. Yeah. <laughs> there Match.com. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. Is that it? Yep. All right, let's give Dr. Kamora a big hand for that presentation. Thank you.